All right, the last one in uh, standard 2D, explain the significance of the Great Awakening. So what we want to do is talk about the Great Awakening and identify it as a movement, as uh, this revival, religious revival, and then what was the significance of it on the American colonist. All right, let's look at the Great Awakening. Uh, simply defined was a period of dramatic religious revival in the colonial in colonial history in the, in the 1730s. It was a rebellion against authoritarian religious rule, and the rebellious spirit spills over into other areas of colonial life. Spirit of rebellion will impact social and political spheres of society as well. We're going to look at that a little bit closer, and we're going to talk about how this great awakening is going to to really exemplify two words: a rebellious spirit against this authoritarian religious rule, and then it, that's going to lead into a rebellious spirit against social rules and a rebellious spirit against political rules as well. So. And this religious revival is going to move into that and create that. It's going to be part of the significance of the Great Awakening. But let's look at why why did these why did these ministers want a religious revival? Okay, why were they looking to have this religious revival? All right, and it falls back on this term called economic materialism. The colonies were starting to prosper. Um, and people will become preoccupied with earning and making a living and spending money and being out in the frontier uh, and doing whatever they wanted to do. Uh, a lot of the people in the colony started becoming more and more indifferent as far as religion goes, as far as the spirit goes. This, this original religious movement was kind of losing its fervor and touch and people were becoming more material. So these group of ministers worried that there was a spiritual decline in the colonists, in the colonies at the time, and the church membership had actually declined. Uh, one of the ministers even said, uh, there's more people in the taverns than there are at church. That was uh, Jonathan Edwards. And so we saw this economic materialism back when we studied the religious tensions of New England when we talked about the halfway covenant, if you recall, that the Puritan church had to offer a half membership because the second, third generation Puritans were more involved in making a, a, a profit in a worldly pursuits of material wealth than to keep in with their original mission of the Puritan church. And they were offered a, a half membership where they could baptize their children and attend church, but they could not vote. And, and the Puritan church had to do this to expand its membership. Here in the Great Awakening, what's also going to happen in the Great Awakening is Puritan church and the Anglican church are going to splinter out into different religions. It's going to split those churches up and the Baptist and the Presbyterians and the Methodists and a host of other religions are going to gain a lot of strength within the colonies and there's going to be a variety and a multitude of different religious sects take off. So where the Puritan church used to have about 40% of the members that went to church, it's going to eventually have only around 2% because all these other different religions are going to take hold. So let's look at what this is about. Um, in the Great Awakening, there's two different types of ministers. One's called the Old Light and the other group's called the New Light. And this religious uh, idea is how, how is religion displayed? How should we actively pursue uh, understanding our own religion? And under the old light, under the old way of doing things, Puritan ministers pretty much gave sermons in church that was uh, religion of the head. In other words, to define that, I mean long intellectual sermons emphasizing an elaborate theological doctrines. In other words, they'd sit and open the open their sermons up, they'd open the Bible up, and they would pontificate the meanings or think about what the meaning of it was. Okay? In other words, knowledge was important, understanding was important. And uh, some of the formality in this, there were customs of civility and courtesy and a strict adherence to order and to moral code and authority. This is under the old light. 
they opposed this old light group of ministers are going to oppose the Great Awakening because they see that the Great Awakening is an attack on the authority of the church. And New Light, the uh, opposition to the old light Puritan minister, the New Light, they had a complaint. They said that people became disinterested in church and found these type of sermons of the head, intellectual sermons, found them boring and disinterested. Okay, let's look at those New Light criticisms. New Light complaint was that people were disinterested and found sermons boring. That people were passively listening to intellectual discourse in a detached manner. In other words, that was a dead formality. The biggest complaint was that people did not personally have control over their own faith that the church did. And that the old light ministers and the church was failing these people and was not keeping the covenant. Uh, George Whitfield, a dramatic and eloquent uh, new light uh, minister said that, uh, that congregations were lifeless because dead men preached to them. And he said that there were too many ministers who were slothful, shepherds, and dumb dogs. And so those were the criticisms of the old way of preaching. And so what we have here with the New Lights is this religious spirit of rebellion. They're going against the old way, this authoritarian religion and with these rules and, uh, and these certain ways of doing things. And rituals and all and so they're starting something new okay what did the new lights offer that was new what was different than the old old guard or the old light was that they wanted religion of passion a religion of the heart that used action and emotion and emphasized those and turned people back and made them repent and bring them back to religion and let them leave uh, that old way of looking for wealthy, earthly desires, money, the profit. Don't want them to come back to the spiritual way and use this passion and this excited teaching, preaching to get them moved. It's the beginning of evangelical preaching in the colonies. And the religious practices and the mindset is going to change. And uh, civility and courtesy of the old lights is going to be exchanged for a quarrelsome, rebellious spirit of this new light group. The new lights interpreted and looked at uh, the religious corruption in the colonies. They blamed it on England, the Church of England. And they said that spirituality was at a low ebb and, and uh, an emphasis was placed on economic materialism. There was illiteracy, immorality, and drunkenness was common everywhere. Uh, and deism of Voltaire was spreading in England and deists believed that there was a higher being we didn't know who it was but the, the, as a clockmaker God made the world like a clock and set things in motion and didn't interfere that was the deism of Voltaire and so uh, preaching became lifeless rational and powerless and few people were listening and this new light group blamed us on the Church of England. And what they wanted, the new light people wanted people to do was to get personal control of their faith. It made Christianity intensely, intensively, or intensely personal to the average person. In other words, take back whether it's rightfully yours. Personal control or personal morality was more important than ritual and ceremony or church ownership or morality. They were very passionate and uh, passionate and emotional involvement and a personal commitment to their own faith were the hallmarks of what the new lights were preaching. And uh, the New Light Changes advocated an emotional approach to religious practice. They promoted the growth of New Light institutions such as Princeton University. We're about to look at those in a few moments. Uh, all these uh, denominational colleges are going to come about because they want uh, people to be knowledgeable. All right, sparked a renewed missionary spirit and evangelical fervor that led to the conversion of African slaves, Native Americans, people of lowly classes even. 
and it led to a greater appreciation for the emotional experiences of faith. One of the, the most popular of these New Light ministers was a very educated man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. And his most famous sermon was Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. He was an itinerant preacher. meant He went from place to place all throughout the colonies, just as George Whitfield did, and delivered these emotional sermons warning sinners to repent, ask for forgiveness and change. And he painted this vivid picture of hell, the torrents and, and the bad stuff of hell, and said that the certainty of God's justice that was that if you repent and turn back and ask for forgiveness and live in a spiritual way, that, that God would forgive you and not let you be damned to hell. So this movement led to a rise of denominational colleges. Harvard in 1636 was a Puritan college. William Mary in 1693 was an Anglican. Yale in 1701 was Puritan. Princeton 1746 was Presbyterian. Columbia University in 1754 was Anglican. Brown was uh, Baptist. Rutgers was Dutch Reformed. Uh, another thing about this is it's going to splinter to all these other different religious sects are going to occur. Now, all of this, uh, this, this religious spirit of rebellion and change is going to change uh, some social things as well. There's also going to be a spirit of rebellion in the social sphere. And uh, what we're talking about here is that some of the preachings of these new light evangelical preachers uh, is uh, it's going to create socially unity and a unifying spirit socially throughout the colonies. Some of the sermons are going to communicate um, that, this, that every soul matters, no matter if you're black, white, male, female, it didn't matter. So this egalitarian idea or values or this democratic concepts such as equality and freedom become spiritual beliefs. So social equality is going to take root and it's because of this uh, that the abolitionists are going to come about and that women's rights activists are going to get their ideas here. There were even women preachers or ministers going out and uh, preaching as well in this uh, great awakening. Also, uh, the, the social and religious spirit of rebellion is going to lead into a political spirit of rebellion. After all, the Church of England was, a, was the source of why there was corruption in the church. So we see that, uh, I'm going to give this term here now, it's probably premature, but the idea that the people could govern themselves. You know, a few moments ago we talked about people asserting self-control over their own religion their own faith, their own atonement. Here we talk about people asserting their control, self-control over their own government, governing themselves. So the chain of command used to be with the old light, with this orderly way, was that God gave power to the ruler and then the ruler ruled over the people. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about John Locke and, uh, and, and his beliefs and how Hobbesian philosophy and Lockean philosophy different. But this this great awakening is going to change this order up. It's going to change it to where God gave to the people rights and then the people gave permission to the ruler to rule over them. So the people are going to take over their right to rule themselves and assert that self-control over their government. All right, let's go back right here one second. Uh, influence politics by driving colonists to question the authority of their government back in Great Britain, uh, Parliament and the King. And then there's going to be this growth in this idea of the notion of state rule as a contract with the people. In other words, uh, social contract or popular sovereignty, the people have a right to rule. And we're going to see this again over in the Declaration of Independence people are asserting control over themselves and their government and this reorder of things here. All right, in the political split, here's, here's that order we're talking about. God gave to rulers uh, divine rights in the old way to rule over the people and the people just did what the ruler said. But with this new idea of taking control over your own government or uh, self-government under 
uh, popular sovereignty is that the people gave God gave the people these natural rights at their birth and so they gave permission and consent for the rulers to rule over them it's going to be very important when we start talking about the declaration of independence and this order of things so it influenced politics by driving colonists to question the authority of government and this growth of idea that uh, the people rule and that the rulers have can rule but only by consent of the people and we and we see this this connectedness with the political sphere from the religious and this idea of covenants and in the churches there was this idea that there was a covenant and that the covenant was that the believer owed allegiance to the church but that the church also owed a duty to be faithful to the gospel and that the people had a right to sever ties with the church if the covenant was broken. So if the church did not hold up to their duty of being faithful to the gospel, to the word of God, then the people had a right to sever their ties. And the people of the Anglican faith and the Puritan faith, are they're going to do just that. And what they're going to do is they're going to enter into other religions like the Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, and a host of other religions. And this carry out of government, the people uh, are going to owe allegiance to their government, but the government owed protection of people's rights. There was a duty of government to protect the people's rights. We're going to see that again later. People had a right to sever their ties with their government if it did not protect their rights. And that's going to be the social contract theory. So here's the parallel between the religion and the political sphere and how these things are going to be rebellious ideas. Uh, so the religious zeal, this emotionally charged revivalism uh, in the Great Awakening is going to turn to revolution and sentiments of self-government. That's the connection we want to make because we're about to talk about the Declaration of Independence and the people separating from Great Britain, Parliament, King George there, and creating their own country. And some of this religious thought, uh, and or not thought, but emotionally charged religious zeal is going to turn and influence the uh, American Revolution and the Declaration of Independence. Many historians say that when the revolution did occur, and that the the people of the colonies felt that their rights had been trampled upon by their government that there were two different ways that the colonists reacted and under uh, the enlightenment thinking we're going to talk about later enlightenment is centered on reason on thinking on thinking things out so a lot of our founding fathers who wanted to have these meetings come together like the first continental congress they want to get together and meet and write out this document the olive branch petition and tell the king and try to reason with him use diplomacy and send it to him that's thinking and strategy that's one way to react to these things going on before the revolution but another one down here a lot of historians argue that the great awakening it had this charged emotion and passion and it created an action within the colonists while these guys were sophisticated up here thinking things out using strategy and diplomacy we had another group of people the sons of liberty dressing up like you know indians getting on to in boston harbor taking this tea and throw it over in the boston tea party so in, in a lot of ways historians believe that this is how the great awakening impacted how people reacted to this American Revolution are being done wrong by their Parliament King George III. So here's the dichotomy of man and we see that uh, that these are both up here we're going to talk about the Enlightenment soon and in, in Standard 3 but right here the Great Awakening. They were different but their ends were the same when it comes to the Declaration of Independence and this new government. William Knox summarizes it best when he said that every man being thus allowed to be his own pope, he becomes disposed to wish to become his own king. And, and this is a really important connection of how this religious, emotional pact, uh, uh, a religious revival movement influences, influences what's going to happen okay, in government, the parallel. The theme here is the Great Awakening Belief in Ideals. So we saw this economic materialism back when we studied the religious tensions of New England 
when we talked about the halfway covenant, if you recall, that the Puritan church had to offer a half membership because the second, third generation Puritans were more involved in making a, a, a profit in a worldly pursuits of material wealth than to keep in with their original mission of the Puritan church. And they were offered a, a half membership where they could baptize their children and attend church, but they could not vote. And, and the Puritan church had to do this to expand its membership. Tarian religious rule and the rebellious spirit spills over into other areas of colonial life. Spirit of rebellion will impact social and political spheres of society as well. We're going to look at that a little bit closer and we're going to talk about how this great awakening is going to, to really exemplify two words. A rebellious spirit against this authoritarian religious rule and then it, that's going to lead into a rebellious spirit against social rules and a rebellious spirit against political rules as well so and this religious revival is going to move into that and create that it's going to be part of the significance of the great awakening but let's look at why why did these why did these ministers want a religious revival okay why were they looking to have this religious revival all right, and it falls back on this term called economic materialism. The colonies were starting to prosper, uh, and people will become preoccupied with earning and making a living and spending money, and being out in the frontier uh, and doing whatever they wanted to do. Uh, a lot of the people in the colonies started becoming more and more indifferent as far as religion goes, as far as the spirit goes. This this original religious movement was kind of losing its fervor and touch and people were becoming more material. So these group of ministers worried that there was a spiritual decline in the colonists, in the colonies at the time, and the church membership had actually declined. Uh, one of the ministers even said uh, there's more people in the taverns than there are at church. That was uh, Jonathan Edwards. And so all right, the last one in uh, standard 2D explained the significance of the Great Awakening. So what we want to do is talk about the Great Awakening and identify it as a movement, as uh, this revival, religious revival, and then what was the significance of it on the American colonist. All right, let's look at the Great Awakening. Uh, simply defined was a period of dramatic religious revival and the colonial in colonial history in the, in the 1730s it was a rebellion against authority